Welcome, and thank you for attending today's HIMSS Industry Solutions webinar, The Business of Healing, Microsoft Operations Solution for Hospitals, Clinics, and Care Facilities, sponsored by Microsoft. During this webinar, we will detail how creative leadership and innovative technology create maximum transparency for innovative healthcare organizations by automating the supply chain and better managing costs, quality, and outcomes. With that, I'd like to introduce our host, Tracy Picone, Healthcare Industry Marketing Leader, U.S. Dynamics at Microsoft. Tracy, you have the floor. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webcast. My name is Tracy Picone. I'm the Senior Industry Market Development Manager for the U.S. Healthcare and Life Sciences Industry at Microsoft, focusing on dynamic CRM and AX. I'm responsible for driving all aspects of business development, including strategy, solutions, strategic partnerships, marketing, and sales. I have well over a decade of experience in the healthcare industry, and I'm passionate about bringing technology solutions to the healthcare industry. Today, we are going to talk about healthcare solutions, and I'm thrilled to introduce Mazik, who is working with Microsoft on a joint solution to address the challenges associated with care coordination telehealth, and supply chain management. Mazik has unmatched and proven healthcare focus. I'm sure you'll see that today when we demonstrate our joint industry expertise, healthcare applications, and consumer stories. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Pat Becker. Pat is Chief Strategy Officer at Mazik Global. She has over 25 years of healthcare information technology experience that includes her tenure as the CIO of the University of Chicago Medical Center and the University Health System Consortium. She also teaches in the Medical Informatics Program at Northwestern University. Pat, thank you so much for being here. We're all looking forward to discussing these important issues with you today. Thank you, Tracy. I'm very happy to be here today. Great. So let's get started. So one area that we know is receiving a lot of focus is the post-acute care coordination. How do we treat and account for the services provided outside of the acute care setting? Sure, Tracy. Many, if not most, patients require follow-up care. This care can take place in a number of settings, the physician's office, a rehab setting such as physical therapy, a rehab stay facility, or even within the patient's home. We are going to discuss three aspects of post-acute care that can enhance the services the patient receives and accurately account for those services and the cost of those services. Today we are going to focus on care coordination, telehealth, and how to accurately capture services and costs. First, let's start with care coordination. It's needed more, in, more than ever as patients are moved as quickly as possible out of the acute care environment to a variety of post-acute care settings. Telehealth, on the other hand, is quickly becoming a means of providing care to patients remotely and monitoring patients' progress once released from the hospital. Finally, we will focus on the need to understand in very concrete ways the services that are performed and the cost of those services. Today, more than ever, we cannot be an effective and efficient healthcare provider without having a much better knowledge of what we do, its cost, and the outcomes of those actions. Great. Okay, so let's start with care coordination. How do today's providers optimize care coordination in and out of the acute care setting? You know, the meaningful use requirements recognize this aspect of care as an issue, and in the stay two requirements made the creation of the transition of care or referral summary using standards such as CCD32, CCR, and the consolidated CCA. Whoa, that's an alphabet soup, isn't it? However, organizations must receive, incorporate, and display information from these documents within their electronical, electronic health record. There are two criteria that are in play. First, there is criteria 314B1, which is the transition of care criteria, and it requires organizations receive, display, and incorporate transition of care of these documents. The intent is for the term incorporate 
to mean that EHR technology would be able to process the structured data contained in the consolidated coordination of care document sections, such as medication problems, medication allergies, so that it could be combined with data already maintained by the EMR technology and would subsequently be available for use. On the other hand, criteria 314B calls for the creation of such a document, and that document is to contain encounter diagnosis, immunization, cognitive and functional status, and in the ambulatory setting, a reason for the referral and the referring provider's name and office contact information. For the inpatient setting, it calls for the document to contain the discharge summary. So the idea being that as a patient is leaving the acute care setting, this document will, or documents, will provide the follow-up care team with sufficient information to prepare the post-acute care providers with the necessary information to uh, render the required care? Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, great. So then let's move on to the next problem in care coordination, which is how does the dispersed team of care providers overcome the difficulties in communicating and maintaining version control of this information? So, Tracy, by easily in importing the transition of care and referral summary, a post-acute care plan may be created that takes into account the follow-up needs of the patient no matter where that care will take place. This plan becomes the treatment plan from which care may be provided. It may anticipate both short and long-term needs and the necessary resources that will be required to meet those needs and the expected outcomes from those services will also be provided. This plan will not only serve to provide treatment to the patient, but it also serves as a planning document for the provider. Can you give us an example? Sure. Now, remember, I'm not a physician, so I'll do the best I can with this. Let's say a patient has recently had knee replacement surgery and is discharged after one or two days in the hospital to their home. Uh, daily home care uh, per, has been ordered by both nursing and physical therapy visits. The patient also has diabetes. So the patient has a primary care physician, an endocrinologist who monitors the diabetes, and an orthopedic surgeon who did the surgery and is responsible for the post is responsible for the knee-related post-operative recovery. For the first week after the patient goes home from the hospital, all three physicians will actively be involved in monitoring the patient from their prospective areas of specialty. If a home health nurse arrives to find the patient confused, short of breath, or with an increasingly swollen surgical wound, all three physicians would need to have this information and coordinate with one another as to what treatment interventions are needed. Without care coordination, the various physicians might each attempt to address all issues, or they may assume that one of the others is addressing one or more of the issues that falls under her specialty area. This lack of real-time coordination results in duplication of orders or conflicting orders or certain aspects of the uh, patient's uh, problems such as confusion. Sometimes these areas could fall through the cracks if there is not real-time um, coordination and centralized communication. There is no version control and all the members of the care team are aware without version control there is uh, no coordination and not all uh, of the care team are aware of actions and recommendations. So it's important that a single unified care plan is created and put into action. This is a great example because as you mentioned, we know that with ever shorter inpatient stays and you know a knee replacement now at one or two days or going home on the same day, we know that this is happening. Dispersed outpatient care teams are going to have communication issues. What are your thoughts? You're correct, Tracy. 
Care coordination really means project management for medicine. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. This works in person, but there is, a there is additional difficulty when care is managed remotely. Modern solutions such as device diagnostic applications and a familiar intuitive user interface using many different types of communications from secure video interaction, uh, interaction among providers, patients and physician portals, and secure messaging all offer solutions to helping with the project management of medicine. I think this is an important issue that we need to discuss because there are so many changes happening at such a fast rate in healthcare, and we're really starting to see change fatigue set in. So I think, I really do think it's very important to be able to use systems that are familiar, intuitive, and easy to use, because I think this will surely help to support or further support our care providers. So with that, let's quickly address three topics surrounding care coordination patient privacy, patient compliance, and distance. And with so many different types of communication outlets, how do you maintain patient provide privacy within multiple providers, clinics, and systems? Persona logistics control uh, allow for a wide range of persons from practitioners, patients, and family to participate securely, privately, and with no unwanted overlap. But this remains an issue that for the most part must be dealt with by education and systems that monitor usage while allowing for easy access to those that the patient or his surrogates have authorized. Okay, so on the other hand, I know from my experience working with providers that one of their chief complaints is ensuring that patients comply with the follow-up appointments and and follow-up directions and their care instructions. You know, patient portals are now an integrated part of electronic health records and other systems as well. This, is, this to an unparalleled degree, allows for instant communications with patients, physicians, and pharmacy. This allows reminders to the patient to be immediate and repeated with home, with home monitoring devices and care practitioners become aware of issues much more quickly. I just recently had my annual physical, and before I even re returned home, my patient a portal had been updated with reminders for me to get blood work done and a mammogram. I think that's so important, and how cool is that, right? We're always on our phones now. It's not necessarily um, follow-up calls. Getting into that portal immediately, I think, is so important. So in addition to that real-time communication with the pa patient and then the monitoring follow-up, there's also the additional difficulty of the distance between the outpatient care team members. How do you address this? That's correct, Tracy, and this certainly has, be has had a negative impact on collaboration. There are now solutions that facilitate one-to-many communication via remote connections easily, accurately, and immediately filled, facilitate care team conversations. The use of secure messaging and email and quick video conferencing all lead to the ability for the care team to communicate effectively and efficiently. So we're going to move into some of the issues with communicating effectively and efficiently that we know some rules and regulations have addressed. But right now, let's move into telehealth. Telehealth or virtual health is an area that we have seen massive expansion over the last several years. And after long periods of discussion, I really think that true advantages of provider health care using this technology are now starting to come into their own. I'd love to hear your opinion, but first I wanted to mention that health IT outcomes reported over 2 million veteran telehealth visits in 2014. And HealthBeat reports that those veterans who use telehealth this year represent 12% of all veterans enrolled in the healthcare system. So with that in mind, how can providers use this type of telehealth functionality to improve their financial returns and improve patient satisfaction scores? 
Telehealth functionality can actually improve financial returns by improving the quality of care and the operational efficiencies by lowering things such as readmissions rates, connecting healthcare providers with patients regardless of geography, and streamlining communication and collaboration between and among providers. Telehealth ultimately delivers improved patient care coordination, better patient monitoring, and the avoidance of non-compliance fees. One hospital I know of measures the benefit of telehealth by the cost savings to the provider and to the patient. These savings include travel expenses for the patient and the provider, which can include driving and hotel expenses. Physicians save time because they are not traveling, and that certainly means that they're able to see more patients. Also, because of the increased collaboration, we've seen that patient satisfaction scores are uh, increasing. And as we know, CMS has, has begun discussing about how patient satisfaction scores will impact reimbursement rates over time. Telehealth can also be seen as an expansion of medical tourism. Patients, particularly those looking at elective procedures, are using the internet to search for doctors across the country or even the globe to perform their surgical needs with the desire to recuperate at home. Their follow-up care is vitally important to surgical outcomes. Telehealth also engages the patient in their care in ways that we have not seen before, creating a stronger partnership between the provider and the patient. Fantastic. So with regards to telehealth, then what is the role of mobile technologies to supporting that stronger partnership between the provider and the patient? You know, these technologies working together, telehealth and mobile technologies, are playing a larger role in healthcare. Devices can be used to monitor patient activity and alert provider of changes. Using telehealth and mobile technology, the provider can have an accurate updated data on what is happening with the, PA, with the patient and react immediately when alerted of issues. Another example is the use of fitness devices. A provider may recommend a certain level of exercise, and this can be recorded on a fitness device and, and uploaded into the electronic health record and then used to uh, discuss with the patient uh, their in increased uh, activity levels. Another area that mobile technologies is, is uh, playing a major role is with the home health provider. It can do things like track their mileage, track their time with the patient, have the uh, care plans that, the, that are compliant with the agency's policies, document the visit, including using the mobile device as a barcode scanner to document medications, take pictures of changed conditions and immediately transfer those to the physician so the consult can quickly take place. Take an electronic signature from a patient so that a claim could be dropped as soon as the visit is completed. And it also saves costs by allowing the provider to document and file documents without returning to the home base. So that brings me to a question that is often asked regarding telehealth. And it is, how does the provider get paid for the services rendered, and how does the provider Additionally, how is the provider protected while providing those services? You know, that's absolutely a good question. Just in the last month, we have seen sweeping legislation in Connecticut to address telehealth. It establishes a regulatory requirements for providing telehealth services, and importantly, it mandates that certain insurance coverage uh, for such services. This is the key since getting paid for these services has been one of the major barriers to its success. The legislation stipulates that patients may receive services via information and a communication technology to facilitate diagnostics, consultation, treatment, education, care management, 
and self-management of the patient's physical and mental health. Licensed professionals acting within their scope of practice in accordance with the applicable standards of care may render these services. This is good news because, as you mentioned, I know this is an area where physicians and patients struggle, and with the amount of time that we have on our hands today, having this type of communication available is going to be vitally important as we move forward, particularly around patient satisfaction, patient compliance, and really utilizing the provider's care efficiently. Yeah, some of the uh, specific of the legislations are that the visits must be conducted using real-time interactive two-way communications, and it's allowed the transmitting of images or data recorded with a camera or other technology from the patient to the remote care provider. Interesting, it, it excludes the use of fax, audio-only telephone, and text messaging and email as a means of delivering these services. Finally, uh, during the first telehealth interaction, providers must inform their patients about the treatment methods and the limitations of providing treatment by telehealth and obtain the patient's consent for using this uh, telehealth technology. And this all must be documented in the patient's health record. I'm sure we'll see other states adopt similar legislation in the near future. Private insurers are beginning to reimburse for these services as well. Both Kaiser Permanente and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center have ex expanded their services to, to include telehealth visits for some of their privately insured patients. This will be interesting because of the um, specific exclusions of uh, text messaging and email because recently, I think it's a topic that's worth exploring for just a minute. We've been hearing of instances where physicians have been fined for emailing through a personal email account or texting information to a patient or other providers through a non-secured portal. And uh, recent, these tactics, while they are time savers and are important to the evolution of communication in healthcare, I know that we need to keep everyone safe. So one of the chief priorities as you mentioned in telehealth, is the ability to securely store and forward patient-related content. How do we do that and keep everyone safe? So, you know, um, store and forward technology related to content allows for providing many types of services to the patient. And this can be done both privately and securing. So you can store and forward images. You can have real-time interaction with the patient. You can do remote monitoring. You can offer professional training, off-site professional training. You can have remote patient consultations. You can have live interactive video conferencing. I mean, it really goes on and on. Uh, but mo um, it can allow for mobile um, health and wellness. All this can be done using single sign-on from the practitioner's point of view. This all allows the provider to provide services without leaving his office and the patient to receive services without leaving their home. Okay, so Pat, with all this in mind, you listed multiple ways that, that this is all good, uh, good stuff for the telehealth and for our providers, but there have to be barriers to expanding telehealth. Can you just give us an example of a few of those? Sure, I really see three major barriers to telehealth at this time. The first is credentialing, allowing a physician to do televisits with a patient in a different state. Today, if a physician is in Chicago and a patient travels to his office from Indiana, there is no, there is no issue. But if that same physician wants to do telehealth visits with that patient, he may not allow to be able to do that unless he is also licensed in, Illinois, in Indiana as well as in Illinois. The second issue is patient privacy. The perception is that these visits could be less private, and they may be if the patient does not have a private place to speak with the doctor. However, this can be handled with education and a discussion of the issue. Remember the Connecticut legislation requires that the physician discuss both the advantages and disadvantages 
And I think one of the issues that could be discussed during that first encounter is privacy and how to maintain that during a telehealth visit. Finally, there are still issues with payer reimbursement. What should be reimbursed? It is the reimbursement at the same level as an inpatient visit. While the, while the Connecticut legislation is a good start, we need more universal clarification. Yeah, and I think that will come definitely, right? But, but getting started is a great place to be right now, I think. So we are actually going to move on into our final topic, which is capturing services and costs. And when we talk about how the Affordable Care Act is driving the transformation of supply chain in healthcare today, one of the first areas we must tackle is cost and the understanding of the services provided that also utilizes resources, both physical and human. You know, it's interesting. In the post-acute care setting, services and supply costs are little understood. But with bundled payments, we need to understand what each provider's fair share is. So just as supply chain is suddenly elevated to being a strategic pillar within the hospital operations, it must also be understood in the post-acute care setting. So in order to effectively manage those post-acute care setting costs, you need to know what, you're, what exactly you're spending on each of those services. That's correct. What is the human resource cost and what is the supply cost? In addition, it is helpful to know what the patient is likely to spend and what drugs and supplies he will need to have and pay for. With this knowledge, you will better understand patient's compliance with the prescribed care plan. If a patient cannot afford the drugs or the supplies, he is unlikely to comply. All of these factors will contribute to the expected outcomes. And remember, outcomes become a measurement of how much a provider will be paid in the future. So Pat, ultimately, how do providers improve their financial returns? As we discussed earlier, telehealth could save on the cost of providing care. post acute care is a less expensive alternative to, acute, to the acute care setting, so the overall organization can save by moving the patient to a post-acute care setting. But in all these settings, we need a full understanding of what we are doing, who is doing it, and how much it costs. We need to capture this information as a byproduct of providing care. By documenting care accurately and in complete detail, we will know what is done and who did it. But we also need to know what products were used to provide that care. Only after we have all this data can we accurately analyze it to determine efficiencies and capture true outcomes. So one of our final items here around services and cost is transparency, which is near and dear to my heart. So in today's environment, Pat, the, my question is, what? this is one of the most crucial or critical, you could say, priorities for a healthcare provider. How do you address it? I think one way that you address it is by having integrated systems that capture services and costs real time and make them easily available to match with the outcomes so that you have a full picture of what was done to the patient and how that impacts his health. Lack of data makes it impossible for managers to truly itemize cost of patient's care. With integrated supply and medication costs, a patient account is appropriately and automatically related to the supplies consumed during his care at the time they are used. Documentation of costs occurs automatically and human error is taken out of the equation and the difficulty around service costing is removed, allowing for better resource management and knowing the true cost of providing care. So what is needed for increased transparency? I think it relies on three areas. First, we need accurate data. It needs to be accurate and reliable. The goal is to obtain this data as a byproduct of the processes that are performed. With this data, we will be able to make decisions based on analysis and fact rather than conjecture. 
However, we still need the tools that will allow this analysis to not be prohibitive to perform. Finally, we'll be able to enhance the organization's to ability to transform its processes because the data and analysis will identify areas that are optimal for transformation for transformation based on the needs of the organization. Wow, I think we're almost to our demo. Thank you so much, Pat. This has really been a great discussion. But now I want to we I want to move into a quick solution demo for some of the technology that we've been discussing. And to do this, I'd like to turn it over to Lane Koreska, the senior marketing manager at Mazic Global, who will actually be able to walk us through some of these applications. Thank you, Tracy, uh, and thanks, Pat. I, I know that we do have very limited time, so I'm just going to briefly touch on a few apps that demonstrate the functionality you've both been discussing. Um, I'm going to start by bringing up Mazic Care as an example of how mobile functionality for care coordinators. Uh, this is a product that Mazic and Microsoft have been developing for years to address specific needs and pain in telehealth and care coordination for nurses, practitioners, and coordinators. So in this role as a care coordinator, no matter where I am geographically, I'm always in touch with my patients and other providers on the care team. So here I've got a tailored mobile dashboard built on Microsoft technology that looks and feels like the intuitive Microsoft tools that I'm used to. So what you can see here is my dashboard. I'm logged in as a care coordinator. Uh, right when I log in using any kind of tablet, I've got my data boxes here, which are going to give me my key KPIs, so my key productivity indicators. And this is all highly configurable. So I'm able to actually see things that I want surfaced to me automatically. So right now I've got it configured for patient satisfaction levels, time utilization, patient outcomes, on-time performance, and so forth. In the next column, I've got my what's new uh, information. And basically what this is going to describe is what information has changed between the last time I logged in and the most recent time for my patients. So here I can see with this patient, Jaden Wood, uh, he has a surgical evaluation uh, for coronary artery disease that's been uh, posted uh, since the last time that I uh, logged in, and that was referred by his physician, Victor Murphy. Uh, here is notifications and communications. So if I'm monitoring a care coordination team, this is going to be really important for me because I'm going to be able to see in real time exactly what the discussion is as it continues to evolve. So here in this example, we have Mary Smith, who is a patient who, um, similar to Pat and Tracy's example, has had a knee replacement, and so she's mentioning to her care coordination team, you know, I'm not in continuous pain, but it does hurt when I sit and when I stand. So then the orthopedic surgeon, Andrew Lewis, says, okay, well, he's going to get in touch with the nurse and say, can you please send me a new picture of the wound and call me on Skype when you're with the patient? Our, our nurse, Nancy, says, sure, I'll call you around 930 in the morning. So here I can see the team schedule. So I know who in the care coordination team is uh, where. I know who's interacting with which patient at which time and covering which part of the workflow. I can monitor this by day, week, month, uh, et cetera. And then also, and I think this is particularly convenient, if I, what if I just want to get in touch with a care coordinator? I want to get in touch with a physical therapist. So I need to reach out to Fernando Matthews, who's on my care team. Um, well, here I can just directly call him. Uh, I can email him. I can chat with him. I can see his information. I can see what office he's uh, coming out of, et cetera. So it's really easy for me to be in touch with the care team at all times. Uh, and then also I've got health news, uh, which is just going to get sent to me automatically based on my preferences, my practice, things of that nature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out of this role for a second, and I'm going to switch into the role of somebody who's actually providing that care. So. In the scenario that we just mentioned, we talked about how the nurse needs to go take a picture of the wound. So now, right now, I'm logged in as Nancy, the nurse here. So what I can do is I log in, and similarly, I see my KPIs. So I see my patient satisfaction rates. I see patient outcomes. And this is all, again, highly configurable, highly tailorable uh, to me and my role. I also have my what's new column, so I know what's changed. I'm in live communication with the entire care team, and in some cases, the patient, and in other cases, uh, family members of the patient. So if a patient is um, old or if they've got a primary caregiver um, who uh, wants to bring family members into the discussion, uh, like a sister or a parent or something like that, we can certainly do that. Um, but then most importantly, I have a list of all my patients. So if I'm a nurse and I'm traveling to see these patients, I'm conducting home health visits today, I need to be able to check uh, their information quickly. I need to be able to see a 360 degree view at a glance. So this really enables me to do that. I can see things like for Lauren Simpson, I can see her age, address, the reason for my visit, active problems. Uh, I can get in touch with her via email, chat, phone, et cetera. 
And then also, I can just go ahead and quickly see, okay, where am I going today? Um, these are my patients, these are their areas, uh, and this is how I'm going to conduct my daily workflow. And then also I get my news items as well. So let's go ahead and jump into our patient here, Mary Smith. So if I know that this is the patient I'm going to be seeing, I want to review all of her information uh, before I get started. So I can actually uh, view her chart, um, but also I can, I think this is very important, I can get in direct touch with the rest of the care team. So I can contact uh, the primary physician, I can contact the physical therapist, what have you, or I can also just start a group conference call. I can also see things like primary insurance information. Before I get started, I want to just go ahead and view the chart. So I want to just get myself familiar and make sure that I know exactly everything that's happening with our patient. Here you can see a very uh, attractive, very arranged, organized uh, display which will give me tiles of all the areas of interest to me as the nurse right now. So I'm really going to be focused right now on care coordination and care plan. But I may also want to check things like allergies, medication, problems, wound management, etc. So let's just jump into care coordination here. Um, again, I can see what the ongoing conversation is between the care team members. I can see any new appointments that have been scheduled. But also I can see what the care plan is. So I can see the goals like pain management. I can see the fitness goals, uh, blood pressure levels, etc. Um, and also I can use this to coordinate the care team follow-up. So I can see, all right, what is the plan for the first day at home? What's the plan for the first week? And so forth. Medications, therapies, uh, and, and such uh, as that. So this is a good way for me to just get quickly up to speed on all of my patient information. Now uh, I've decided, okay, this is the patient that I'm visiting. This is the first one on my list. Let's go ahead and get driving directions. Um, this is integrated with Bing Maps, so we can just go ahead and uh, automatically get our directions. It's going to take us from our office here in Chicago to Minneapolis. Let's start driving. Now, once I am in the home, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to very simply start the assessment. And this is, again, very, very easy for me to do. It's very comfortable for me as the uh, nurse, but also for the patient. So rather than, um, you know, me setting up a workstation and me turning my back to enter information into a computer, what have you, uh, I might just be sitting uh, in the living room with the patient, holding a tablet in my hand, sharing this with her and saying, okay, well, let's go ahead and take information like your vital signs. Um, and again, this is all highly configurable, but for this particular scenario, we want to take things like blood pressure, temperature, pulse, respiration, glucose, what have you. Uh, and then this is, I think, where it gets really interesting. So for symptoms, once we start the actual encounter, um, what I can do is I can just go ahead and share the tablet with the patient, and we can just go through it together. So it's very collaborative. So we say, all right, uh, let's talk about your pain level. She says, okay, it hurts a little bit more than it used to. Uh, are we noticing any fatigue, any nausea, anything like that? And so very simply, we're just going to go ahead and click on the symptoms that our patient is feeling. Um, and again, so this is very collaborative. It's very discussion-based. And if there's any notes, if there are any additional qualifiers that I want to add or that the patient would like me to note, um, I also have the ability to do voice notation as well. So I'll just click this and I'll just talk directly into it and it'll note uh, anything I want to add to the encounter. So as we continue uh, and go through the assessment, um, there are other uh, areas of information that we want to cover. I'm not going to go through these just for time's sake, but you can see here that uh, we might cover things like living situation, uh, you know, medical treatment, service needs, um, you know, is she getting around with a, a walker, does she require personal assistance, uh, things like that. So let's uh, go ahead and jump into the exam. The reason that we're here today, uh, in addition to checking up, is that the orthopedic surgeon asked us for a new photograph of the wound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'll look at uh, the knee, which is what we're here to see. So let's talk about, um, okay, what are you feeling there? Is there some edema? Yes. There's some tenderness? Yes. Um, the patient says to us, uh, you know, the tenderness comes and goes. So we'll just go ahead and note that here. And then we can go ahead and actually begin to document the injury. So I know this is a little bit graphic, but uh, uh, this is what we would be doing. Uh, and so we can go ahead and look at previous versions of the wound. If we want to add the new photo, we can go ahead and do that. I'm not going to take a picture of my knee or anyone else's for this, but you get the idea. Uh, and then we can move on down to medications. Okay, so what's the pain level? Uh, what medications is the patient on? Is she complying with her medication plan? Uh, yes or no? We can monitor all of that from here. So uh, let's just say, you know, we want to up the dosage of ibuprofen or what, what have you. So we can just go ahead and simply do that. We want to share that information with the care team and the patient, certainly, but we also want to share the information with let's say the patient's daughter, uh, because she's 
living in the home part-time or something like that, and she needs to know that. So we'll go ahead and share that. Um, and this is really good because this gives us the opportunity to go ahead and review the information. Uh, is there anything that she wants to add? Is there any notation that we haven't included that she wants us to make mention of? So we certainly have the opportunity to do that. Um, once we've gone through this and once we've actually completed all the tasks that we set out to, let's go ahead and review everything that we did with the patient today. So what I can do is I can go ahead and go through uh, my notes, I can go through the vitals, I can go through my subjective and my objective notes, I can see the patient assessment, the patient plan. I'll review this with Mary, I'll say, is all this accurate? Uh, she'll say, yes it is, or no it's not. Um, Mary can actually rate her satisfaction with the care we've delivered, she'll say it's great. Uh, and then we'll just ask her to sign off on it, she'll give her signature, we'll give ours, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just very simply generate the report. And so this report is an automatic, standardized itemization of everything that was conducted during the encounter today. So I think this is really important because what this does is it shares um, all this information automatically with everybody on the care team. Um, and so there's uh, one version of truth, there's very little uh, overlap, uh, and this kind of reduces the uh, opportunity for there to be um, uh, duplication or confusion or added layers of complexity. So there's one last thing that I'd like to show here real fast. Um, we've talked about this uh, from the patient side, but what about from the materials and the supply chain side? So we talked about um, changing the patient's medication, uh, upping the dosage, or maybe if we had prescribed something new, that would automatically go to the patient's uh, pharmacy via e-prescription. But what about on the inside of the operation, so the in-house uh, warehouse performance and supply chain? So we have apps uh, for that as well where we can similarly manage our key productivity indicators uh, at a glance. We get a 360 degree view of our system and our entire supply chain in real time. So I can monitor things like warehouse performance, uh, emergency orders, vendor performance. I can see what uh, locations are below um, PAR standards. Um, I can also do things like uh, inquiries for new requisitions. I can monitor areas like surgery and radiology to see what's below PAR levels. Uh, I can also monitor stock counts by warehouse. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to take a, one more minute here and I'm just going to say let's show you how a supply requisition would work in a scenario like this. Um, the idea is, is that we're managing this uh, from one dashboard. Everything that we need to do is within one or two screens. Um, so if I want to go ahead and filter my product category, we'll say, all right, apply, uh, hospital supplies, this is the item that we want to uh, request more of. So we'll just move it from one location in our ecosystem to another, and then we can go ahead and request, let's say, 2,000 of these items. Okay, so similar to Amazon or any other consumer shopping portal, it's just gonna go straight into my shopping cart. So we can go ahead and review that. Let's say, all right, this is our details. We've got one item, this is the status, this is the date, this is the item. Let's go ahead and submit that and then that requisition is automatically posted. So as a materials manager, I'm able to monitor things like the requisitions that I've uh, put in myself, I can track incoming POs, I can locate inventory, things of that nature. So the idea is, is that it's all very intuitive, it's all very uh, secure, but it's all very mobile and highly flexible as well. So that's just a, a little bit that I wanted to show. I know that I've already run over my time here, so I'm gonna turn it back to you, Tracy. Um, and we can jump back into our slides. Uh, so thanks very much, there's more to see, and I know that uh, at the end of this, we're gonna be uh, offering some downloadables uh, and some deliverables, so if you're interested in following up, uh, certainly please reach out to us. So Tracy, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thanks, Blaine. So Pat, I, you know what? It looks like we might have time for a couple of questions, but Pat, I just wanted to give you the floor for any last words before we close out this portion of the webinar. Thank you, Tracy. Again, I just wanna wrap up um, by saying that today uh, we uh, showed you some of the changes we believe that are occurring in the post-acute care environment as the result of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we've shown the impact of telehealth and some of the advantages that are quickly taking place from both a technology and a regulatory standpoint. And finally, we've shown how the advanced systems can assist in understanding the full cost of services provided so that reimburse, the reimbursement model as it changes, you can determine the best way to distribute revenue and to understand the relationship between services and the outcome to the patient.
Okay, before we take questions, I'll just uh, sign us off, so that'll do it for us today. I do want to thank Pat and Lane from Mazic Global, and thank everyone online who joined us for this webinar. I do see we've got some questions, but before we take those, as a follow-up to this webcast, it's been recorded, and a copy will be sent to each of you. And if you have any more questions, or you'd like a deeper conversation into this content, please reach out to Mazic at info at mazicglobal.com. Right now, I'm going to turn it back over to Susan, and we'll take some questions. Pat, if you'll stay on and help answer, that would be fantastic. Sure, I'd be happy thank, to. Uh, thank you so much, Tracy, Pat, and Lane. That was very informative. Uh, we do have a few questions, so we can begin on those. Um, the first one is, is telehealth required to follow HIPAA requirements? So this, uh, this is Pat. Yes, you know, medical privacy and confidentiality issues extend to telehealth. Under uh, HIPAA, telehealth clinicians have the same responsibilities as they do if the patient comes to their office. Um, they need to protect the patient medical records and keep information regarding uh, their treatment uh, confidential. Um, electronic files such as Im images and audio and video recordings must be stored with the same precautions and care as any paper documents are. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's our next question. What is the patient acceptance of telehealth and mobile technologies in the home? You know, uh, recent studies show that the acceptance of these technologies is much like uh, it is outside of healthcare. About two thirds of people are, are immediately willing to use these technology. Age and education are a factor, uh, but also once a patient is aware that they may need to make fewer visits to the facility, the distance factor contributes to their willingness to participate. Other factors that can assist in their willingness is the savings of time and the cost of travel. So concerted efforts should be made to educate the patient and their families on the advantages of these technologies. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, I have a question. What is the ROI for using this complex an application, keeping in mind the reducing payment and increased workload? Well, the ROI comes from the fact that you're able to save costs uh, for the providers by having them not tr travel, but at the same time, by effectively understanding what your costs are, you can look at areas where you can reduce those costs and where you can be more efficient. So ROI is very dependent on the particular organization and how you're using the technologies, but we have seen a great ROI, um, it's particularly with telehealth and um, we're beginning to see, as uh, I think Tracy pointed out, 12% of veterans' uh, visits are now being done by telehealth, and that uh, is a savings both for the, the provider and for the patient because of the travel um, advantages, as well as um, potentially um, you're reducing the potential for uh, negative uh, fees related to reimbursement if a patient is readmitted um, within the 30-day period. So there's quite a myriad of potential ROI benefits. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, is this internet network dependent? So certainly the applications that we show you today um, have their greatest advantage when they are um, attached to the network but you are able to also use them um, without an, an internet um, connection and then later when you have an internet connection it will forward um, the uh, information to the places it needs to go. Obviously in the, in the demo that Lane showed you, if that patient had an immediate need to, to talk with the orthopedics because of some changes to the wound, that would have been better handled um, via a quick secure video conferencing. But again, if that's not available, um, you can um, do it l at a later time. Okay, uh, thank you. And it looks like we have one more question. How are MS care coordination and portal applications tied to EHRs to successfully claim meaningful use? 
So um, we have a number of ways that we can tie to um, the electronic health record, and we can either use web services technology, with, which is uh, out-of-the-box functionality that's available, or we can use the traditional HL7 messages. Um, we've been able to uh, work in both kinds of environments. So um, web services makes it a little quicker. Um, but um, the HL7 messaging is, is also doable. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask the audience to take part in an exit survey that will be popping up on your screen very shortly. And uh, if there's nothing else, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. It's been very informative. You'll receive an email in the coming days with a link to the replay of the, this webinar and you can share it if you'd like. Um, and I thank everyone, and uh, have a wonderful day.